Welcome to Corwin's Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast with host Peter DeWitt. This podcast is from education leaders for education leaders. Every week, Peter and our guests get together to share ideas, put research into practice, and ensure every student is learning, not by chance, but by design. Hey, Earl. How are hey, you? Hey, Peter. Good. How are you? I'm doing well. No, I'm ready for another podcast. Me too. Me too. I'm especially ready about ready for this one because it's about one of my favorite topics, women in leadership, um, which is something I, you know, I don't think we talk enough about. So I'm just so excited for our guests today. Yeah, I remember it was a few years ago, I wrote a blog, where are all the women in K-12 leadership? Um, and it, it, it actually did very well from a readership standpoint, but it, it definitely um, struck a chord with people. And it was an interesting learning experience for me because I wanted to put that out there. I, and I had such an, you know, I had a different experience when I was a teacher because I was an elementary school teacher. And you usually see that like it's female dominated in elementary school. But when I became a principal, I was the first male principal in 50 years. So the wow. school went around for 50 years. I was the first male principal. and. So I was just really interested because I feel like you don't, you don't see, and you're starting to see it more and more, but you don't see a lot of women. You see, we know that in, in education, there are a lot of female teachers, but then you've got a male dominated administrator, right? There are a lot of male, uh, males in the in administration. And that's what I know that, you know, our guests are going to talk about in this podcast too. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, so our guests today are Dr. Trudy Ariaga and Dr. Dolores Lindsay. They are um, the authors of Leading While Female, which was published by Corwin. They have um, a third co-author, Dr. Stacey Stanley, who wasn't able to be here with us today. Um, but you're going to hear from Trudy Ariaga, who was a former is a former superintendent and is currently the associate dean in the Graduate School of Education at California Lutheran University. Um, and she's the co-author of Opening Doors. And then Dr. Dolores Lindsay is also a former district administrator and professor in educational leadership. And she is also the author of numerous books in the area of cultural proficiency. So they have a wealth of experience and writing behind them and research to bring to this discussion. And so excited for you all to hear it. Welcome to Leaders Coaching Leaders, uh, Trudy Ariaga, um, Dolores Lindsay, and I know that you have another co-author. You have Stacy Stanley, who is not able to make it, but I just wanted to say, you know, Dolores and Trudy, thank you so much for being on the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast. Thank you. We're delighted to be with you. Our co-author, uh, Dr. Stanley, is busy being a new superintendent this morning, and uh, cannot join us, but uh, she's she's with us in spirit for sure. That's, that's right. So the book is is um, leading while female, and you know this is such a, a a great issue to discuss. I remember years ago for my Finding Common Ground blog for Ed Week, I wrote a blog on um, where are all the women in educational leadership because it was a constant. Like it was a discussion that I just felt like every time I worked with principals, it was heavily male. And I was I was actually raised by very strong women. Um, so when I wrote the blog, I was actually kind of surprised at the response. And I think it's a it's an issue that we need to be able to talk about. So what brought about this book for the three of you to start writing? Like what inspired the 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 discussion and the ultimate book? I think that, you know, the same uh, reasons that you're referring to, Peter, is what we have experienced, all three of us, in our lifetimes is recognizing that 75% of the teachers in this nation are females, uh, but yet 25% uh, of the superintendents in this nation are. And so, you know, if we are the bulk of the essential workers in education, the teachers, um, how is it that we don't progress to the superintendency? And so um, as we looked at the compelling data and then um, shared our own stories of uh, inequities, gender inequities in our journeys, and then listened to the stories of literally thousands of other women 
Um, and then I think finally, uh, we're all grandmothers. And so as we thought about, you know, the world that we want our grandchildren to grow up into, both our grandsons and our granddaughters, uh, the book became uh, Why Wouldn't We? And one of our, um, uh, one of the quotes that we often refer to is, uh, you know, if, if, um, if there's a book you've always wanted to read, um, but it hasn't been written, then you must be the one to write it. And so, you know, we, we uh, took that seriously and brought it forward. I like that. You, in, in one of the chapters, you talked about owning the stories we tell. Um, our, our counter narratives. Dolores, what is that all about? Well, as Trudy said, um, we saw a need uh, for this book. And the narrative, the master narrative, if you would, has been about men leading school districts and uh, men, <clears throat> men administrators moving up very quickly as opposed to women uh, <clears throat> taking their time. And um, we read story after story of women uh, as teachers, then teacher leaders, then coordinators, then directors, then assistant superintendents, and then superintendents. And then we knew of the, the stories of males that would be um, <clears throat> teachers, grade level coordinators, deans or assistant principals, uh, then principals, then assistant superintendents and superintendents. And their path was much shorter, much quicker. And so we read that as the master narrative over and over again. And we saw that as gender inequity. And so the counter narrative then would have to be about what is gender equity. And we wanted to make sure that we captured the stories uh, that would be the counter narrative and make sure that women could hear that their story was not the only story. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started with what we thought was going to be a small focus group, 10 or 12 women, and we sent out a few invitations and word of mouth spread. And we ended up on a Saturday morning here in San Diego with 35 women uh, and mostly women of color mm -hmm. because we the message we sent out was we were interested in this counter narrative and the women showed up ready to tell their stories. And we've included those uh, stories in, in our research uh, mm -hmm. so that other women can hear the stories and know that their story is not the only one and that there is a different pathway um, we talk about that it's, it's not about competence. The women are certainly very competent to lead at the higher levels. Uh, we found that it was about a lack of confidence. Uh, over and over the stories we heard was, well, I'm, maybe I'm not quite ready, or maybe I need another degree, or maybe I need some more workshops. And, uh, and then realizing that their male counterparts were moving on past them. Uh, very quickly. Um, and, and we also found in our research that uh, males will apply for a position uh, before they're fully qualified. In other words, if they meet 65, 70% of the uh, qualifications at an, an application process, they'll go ahead and apply. And in many cases, we'll get the position where women will wait until they're fully qualified uh, meeting all the qualifications or requirements on an application. And by the time they do that, uh, developing their confidence along the way, the male counterpart has already gotten the job. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the counter narrative. And in, in doing that, in that particular chapter, we told our stories and hoping that, uh, that women could learn from our own stories. And, and hear the counter narrative as well. Oh, they certainly can. What does, Trudy, what does gender equity look like? Like if we're going to, when I think about that whole six, the research showing, you know, if a male sees that they can 65 to 70% of, of the qualifications, okay, I'm going to go for it. And women don't feel the same. 
how do we get over that? What does gender equity actually look like? You know, I think first that uh, gender equity is reflected in the data of the system, the data of the organization, and that may be a school, that may be a district, you know, that may be a county, whatever that is, but certainly the data will reflect it. But what it actually looks like, I think, uh, is uh, what it feels like, you know, and what it feels like is that women are treated with dignity and respect, that uh, the barriers that um, we have identified are um, not existent in organizations where there are gender equity. Dolores referred to you know, the barrier of the tri traditional pathways, a district that uh, really promotes and lives gender equity would be encouraging women to be their high school math teachers, to be their high school principals, um, because we know that that's the pathway. Actually, 80% of the superintendents in this nation were secondary principals, but yet very few secondary principals are females. And so gender equity looks like um, a human resources department that, that annually uh, reviews their interview process, reviews their um, informational materials about jobs, reviews who's on the panel, reviews who are, who are making the um, uh, reference checks that, you know, that that's just a constant revamp. Um, if you continue to see that the only high school principals you're getting are the male high school principals. Uh, gender equity uh, recognizes that women have delays along the way. And unapologetically, we have delays along the way. So whether that's caring um, for our elderly parents, like Peter, you and I just discussed, um, or whether it's, you know, child rearing, what, or whether it's following a spouse or a partner, uh, we have delays along the way. And that the, a gender equity would be that that is not uh, that is not something that works against us, that that is something that, you know, that we admire and respect and acknowledge and recognize that perhaps some of our delays uh, make us the stronger leaders within the organization. Um, you know, I could keep going, but um, gender equity is also making certain that within an organization that women's networks are supported. Um, and that we don't look at affinity groups as something that is exclusive. Actually, they're inclusive of those who have been historically excluded. Um, and so whether it's formal mentoring programs or whether it's networks or making sure that women are sponsored. Um, and I would say lastly, um, gender equity looks like an organization where bigotry um, is just absolutely not tolerated, not in the boardroom and not in the locker room. And that leadership stands up and uh, makes certain that that's talked about on a regular basis, that in this organization, we, uh, uh, we adhere to what we say we believe. How often organizations say, we treat all people with dignity and respect, but yet um, there are examples where people are not treated with dignity and respect. So those would be just some of the, um, uh, uh, again, I think feelings that, uh, that people would feel when they're within an organization where gender equity is um, of top priority. Yeah, it's, those, are, that's, those are great examples. It makes me think about when I was a school principal, there were 10 of us, K-12, and it was 50% men, 50% women. The superintendent and assistant superintendent were females. Eight years later, that whole school district, every single one of the administrator positions is actually male. It went from, <laughs> and I was just thinking about that when you were talking, because that is that is train, changed dramatically. You mentioned some barriers, Trudy, and I'd like to go to Dolores for this. What are some other barriers that, you wrote about in the book when you talked, you know, I know chapter three was on confronting and overcoming barriers. What are some other barriers that maybe people don't think about? Like I always think about, I've done a lot of work on race and equity through, I have a show called A Seat at the Table for Education Week where I've interviewed experts. And I always know that I have a sort of this, this male white perspective. What are some barriers that you wrote about in the book that some people don't even think about when it comes to barriers that women have when it goes for leadership positions? 
Well, Peter, that's actually one of the questions that we ask as we interviewed women, excuse me. <clears throat> we ask what gets in the way. And um, one of the things that we knew going in as we use the framework of cultural proficiency, uh, the, the barriers that are out there structurally are the systems of oppression and the systems of privilege and entitlement. So those are the things that are embedded in, in every organization that, that people may not realize, may not be aware of, but they manifest themselves in uh, comments like um, when we ask women what were some of the barriers, um, they said, well, they, they experienced the, what they call the good old boys system. And uh, they, we heard comments like, uh, well, it's, it's really late in your career to be thinking about <clears throat> moving on up in our organization. Um, <clears throat> things like, well, you know, you really, we found that you really don't work well with other women. Uh, and that that in itself would be a barrier. Uh, <clears throat> comments like, well, you know, you, you wear your heart on your sleeve. You're really too emotional. Um, uh, she, she needs to, uh, she's a little too reserved. She doesn't speak up enough. And then we'd hear another woman say, you're really, uh, you're really outspoken. You really need to dial it back a little bit. And especially women of color, uh, they got comments like they received comments like, um, that implied the angry black woman. And it would be, um, uh, disguised sometimes as you're really outspoken. Well, those uh, those uh, comments uh, they would hear over and over again. The biases were really there, the unconscious bias, but in in reality they were quite conscious. I think um, <clears throat> uh, they made comments like um, they decided to leave districts and would go to a district where they found more support for women. Uh, we also asked the question, what supported you along the way? So we found the, the counter, again, if you would, the counter narrative in districts that supported them. Uh, but continuing um, uh, just the uh, everything from the way they wore their hair, their hairstyles, the way they dressed. Uh, and, and some folks have said to us, are you, is that really true? As if the women made up the stories. Uh, and we got that, those reactions from men. Uh, are, are you sure that happened? Did you really hear that? And over and over again. Um, and then the, the, the resistance to change. Um, well, we, we tried that once and it, it didn't work, or we already have women in the system. We actually heard this comment, Peter, um, um, in an interview panel for a um, high, school uh, high school assistant principal. Someone on the interview panel said, well, you know, if we place her there, that's going to make three women at that school as administrators. Thankfully, someone else on the panel said, well, we've had three men at school sites forever. Um, I experienced a young woman coming to me after a presentation that I gave, and <clears throat> I've been in this business uh, almost 50 years now. And sometimes I think my stories get a little old. Uh, and so I told one of my stories. And at the end of the session, a young woman came up to me and said, you know, Dr. Lindsay, please don't stop telling your stories because just this year, my principal, a male said to me, and she was an assistant principal at that time. She said, her principal said to her, you know, if you expect to be a principal in this district, you're gonna have to start acting more like a man. And she said, that was just last year. And so just when we think we're making some progress, those same old barriers from 30, 40 years ago uh, are still in the system because they're so strongly embedded in the system that sometimes people don't see them. 
in the system. And it takes um, a strong leader, superintendent, uh, male superintendent, since there's so many of them, to say, wait a minute, let's examine what the barriers are and how they're manifesting themselves uh, to delay the progress of women. So uh, those are, are some of the examples of, of the barriers that we actually heard women. And this is just, you know, a year. And we continue, Peter, every time we hold a, a session or conversation and Trudy and Stacy and I, uh, because of our website, um, we and our Facebook group, we continue to get statements and comments from women about this is what happened to me recently. Um, so your theme around thriving or, or surviving, we know that many women are just surviving in their districts till they can get to that district that Trudy was describing a few minutes ago, a, a gender equity district, an equitable situation where they can really thrive. There's definitely a, there's definitely a, a double standard between how a man can act and how a woman can act when they're when they're in a leadership position. And I know that we've been talking a lot about schools, but I can't help but think when the both of you are talking and um, what about within your career as researchers and writers, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're looking at things like educational leadership? Because I have found that educational leadership is dominated by men. And men, I'm a man, so I. <laughs> but I think about strong women that have done amazing educational re research, like Avis Glaves and Lynn Sherritt and you know Vivian Robinson out of New Zealand. But what about what about the the two of you, I, I know that uh, Dr. Stanley's not here to be able to talk, but what about the two of you when it comes to writing about educational leadership and doing research on it? Um, do you find that these same, these same issues that you're talking about within the K-12 system mirror what you're seeing within the K-12 research educational writing space? Trudy? Well, I think, you know, very simply the answer would be yes. Yes, we do. And, and although our focus is on education and our focus is even narrower in regards to K through 12 education, uh, we know that the stories of, of, that we've shared are within organizations throughout. This is not just about um, educational leadership. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we did very um, intentionally uh, in our book, which drove our editors a bit crazy, was that we wanted the first name of every every work researcher we cited and utilized in our research because we wanted women to be recognized. And obviously within our book, uh, the majority of those that we benefited from were women. And so that was intentional on our part to make certain that, you know, that we are looked at as researchers and we are recognized and noted um, as very competent researchers. And it's back to that issue that Dolores brought up of confidence versus competence, that uh, when we're able to um, display our competence, um, our confidence also rises. And that is one of our major goals, the three of us as researchers and authors, is to promote that confidence in others. And that's confidence to research, confidence to write, um, how many times people have after our session said, how, please tell us how you started, mm -hmm. you know, and we love to tell the story. We started around the Lindsay's kitchen table, you know, with glasses of wine and uh, tears and laughter, uh, but that's how we started. And so we're, we're pleased to share our story with other women so that they know that, you know, if you have a book in you, if you have research in you, we encourage you to utilize it. Dolores, thoughts? Yes, um, uh, Peter, Trudy and I are both uh, members of higher ed as well. Mm -hmm. Trudy comes out of the K-12 family. And I also, after having been a K-12 leader and then on into higher ed, and we we find the same situation in higher ed. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Trudy and I are, are both white women, identify as white women. What we found with our colleagues of color, and I, I, they can tell their own stories, 
But my experience has been at the university level and as researchers, uh, we hire people of color, but we don't support them. Mm -hmm. And so they may be the only one uh, in many meetings, in many sessions, in many universities. And so uh, my husband, Randy Lindsay, and I have made it part of our business over the years to support uh, colleagues in their writing. And sometimes we find that having a male author, a lead author, gets the attention of publishers, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, articles or blogs or books. Uh, and I'll just put that out there uh, because um, it, it is more difficult, I think, uh, to get the attention. And, and we're very intentional, as Trudy said, uh, we don't use initials uh, for our writing. Instead of D.B. Lindsay, I put out there Dolores. I don't I haven't met a man named Dolores yet, but, uh, you know, it could be. But we're very intentional that people will recognize uh, what possibly could be a, a female name. Mm. But we are we're making sure that we mentor women in the field of research, women mentoring women. And then also men mentoring women, but men mentoring men about the assets that women bring, both in uh, K-12 and as researchers and as um, uh, professors. Uh, I'll, I'll, there are organizations and uh, statewide organizations and national organizations that do not have enough women members. And it's up to the men in those organizations to mentor each other about why they need more women members uh, in those organizations for the purpose of doing the research. Women have a different perspective. They bring a different perspective. They have a different voice. And that voice and that lens for research uh, needs to be available to folks. We we actually used your blog. Uh, where are all the women? Uh, oh. <laughs> yes, we did. That caught our attention because that too was our question. Mm -hmm. And um, I will also tell you that in research, I, I read an article years ago written by an African American female, and her question was around the master narrative that publishing companies are looking for a one particular way that people write articles mm -hmm. and that uh, people of color and women of color may in fact not write in that way. They don't match that, again, master narrative. And her question was to publishing companies, I'm sorry that I don't remember her name, but her question was, why don't you listen to our stories? Why don't you listen to our way of writing? We have a different way of writing. And it's what she called it the counter narrative. And it was a plea to publishing companies to pay attention to the way we write. And uh, so I appreciate your question very much because it is an area of gender inequity uh, and gender and race go hand in hand and we talk about intersectionality. And uh, so it's, it's we emphasize gender equity, but uh, we also emphasize uh, gender and race uh, as we do our research. And if I could okay. jump in, Peter, and just oh. say to, to, to Dolores, I'm pleased that she said that because I want to make sure that we recognize that when we talk about gender equity, we're not talking about binary gender equity, male, female. Mm -hmm. uh, we, um, you know, we recognize and appreciate um, just, uh, you know, that uh, when we speak of female, that we recognize that the intersectionality of each and every female is one that creates the diversity and the uniqueness and the brilliance of who we are. Um, and, you know, most specifically when we speak to um, gender, you know, we um, want to make sure that we are recognizing the LGBTQ plus community and, you know, all of the fluidity 
uh, that comes with um, uh, gender. And as somebody who does a lot of writing for LGBTQ+, um, I appreciate that. I think one of the things that you just reminded me of too, as we start to close this out is one of the things that I have really been confronted with over the past year and a half of doing a seat at the table and even starting this podcast with Ariel Curry, my editor at, at Corwin, is the idea of that, that monolith, that not everybody's story is just a one story. The, the story of women is not just one single story, right? And that's why I love the fact that within your book, you were talking about these counter narratives and you were sharing so many stories. And it doesn't surprise me Dolores, I think you're the one who said that when you wanted to start off with the, the list of like 10 to 12 people, it grew. It doesn't surprise me at all because everybody, you know, everybody has such a unique story. And I love the fact that you've been able to, to focus on that. I want to close off by saying, because this is the, the season is from surviving to thriving, I want to thank Dolores for, <laughs> for bringing that up more than I did. So uh, that was good. Um, but but one of the things, it, chapter seven, you wrote, Leading While Female, A Call for Action. And I'd like to end that with, with the two of you. And maybe, Dolores, I'll, I'll go to you first. Is there, as people are listening to this podcast, women or men listening to this podcast, what would you say is a, a call to action that you would want them to think about? Well, I want them to know who they are. Who, who the question we ask is, who am I? And then asking the question about the organization. Who, what, who is this organization? What are their values, beliefs, assumptions? And then look for that alignment. Mm -hmm. uh, who am I within this organization? Um, cultural proficiency is what we call an inside out approach. And so uh, just asking over and over again, um, who am I and am I who I say I am? And then look at the organization. Who is the organization? Who do we say we are? And are we who we say we are? And that if you come up with gender inequity in that organization, then the call to action really is to look around you and see, is this a thriving organization uh, ready to support women in, uh, in, in leadership positions, leadership roles? And then maybe you have to look at uh, making a really hard decision about what, where do we go from here? What might be your next step? Thanks for that. Trudy, what about you? Gosh, um, very similar in that the call to action from my perspective is just that opportunity to say, do our actions reflect what we say we believe? And to be able to look at that organizationally, and as Dolores said, you can't do that until you've, until you've done some of your own personal work. You know, your personal culture, your personal journey, is there trust and confidence within the organization? Um, and recognizing that, that, that that's not frill work. That's not when you have time work. That's foundational work. And doing that foundational work and then being able to look at policies and practices and procedures and behaviors and attitudes and asking yourselves each and every time as we're making decisions as leaders, uh, do our decisions reflect what we say we believe as an organization? And, you know, we speak about women as leaders, but really the impact we're looking for is the impact on our children. Mm -hmm. You know, can our children look up and find themselves? And uh, when we talk about gender equity, can, you know, can our boys and our girls, our sons and our daughters, can they look up um, without predict predictability and find themselves? Um, and uh, there's the organization that uh, when a child can look up, you know, there's that, that comment, that quote, if they can see it, they can believe it. Mm -hmm. You know, so if they can look up, if they can see it, then they can believe it. And, and that's, that's the call to action is that our children can look up and find themselves and find themselves in places um, that are not predictable. And uh, women, uh, I'll finally say, you know, absolutely, we want a seat at the table, but we want a voice at the table. 
-hmm. And um, I often say, you know, I'm not afraid to eat alone. So, you know, so, you know, I got my own table. I'd be happy to invite people to the table. So we don't just want to be invited for a seat at the table. We want a voice at the table. And we also would welcome, you know, welcome our, our allies to come to the table. And um, our book is absolutely not about disparaging uh, the contributions that our male allies and colleagues have have um, upon um, us and the educational system. It's, it's just an opportunity to be better as we move it forward. Thank you both. That's a perfect way to end um, this discussion. The book is called Leading While Female. And uh, Dolores and Trudy, thank you so much for, for being on the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast. I know Stacey Stanley would be very honored with uh, how you answered the questions and the dialogue that we just engaged in. But thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the work that you've done over the years. Great benefit to all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Peter, for this opportunity. We appreciate it. You know, Ariel, one of the things that I appreciated so much from that podcast was not just the topic, because I think it was a really important topic, but that they were able to talk um, deeply about what gender equity actually looks like in schools. And yes. I think that gives a good roadmap for, um, for schools. And what I also appreciated is that it's not about excluding, I think Trudy said it, it's not about excluding a male. It's about making sure we're more inclusive when it comes to um, to men and women. And so I appreciated that a lot from the podcast. Yes, exactly. And I love um, I love what Dolores said about the stories we tell mm -hmm. and that it's so important. I mean, when you when you look at the stories around school leadership and I, I know because I read tons of school mm -hmm. leadership books, it is the stories are dominated, you know, by by male stories. And it's um, it's exciting and empowering to hear more stories of women. I thought it was so interesting. I think it was Trudy as well, who said that, you know, we know the pipeline to school leadership or the pipeline to um, district leadership is uh, usually people who have experience as secondary principals mm -hmm. and most secondary principals are men. So mm -hmm. taking a look at that pipeline and making sure every step along the way in that pipeline, we're being inclusive and, and looking for opportunities to be more inclusive. So I, that was really eye opening to me. Yeah, it was, it was just uh, a lot of important information. And I think that their book, um, is definitely an important read for people too. Yes, yes. Well, I hope everyone goes out and gets it, reads it. Uh, if you haven't already, please leave a review for this podcast. If you want to catch us on YouTube, there's a YouTube channel. And with that, I think we will uh, be back next week. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Ariel.